Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 54th episode of Don't Forget the Popcorn. In the space of movies, we typically talk about the best movies ever made, the best genre flicks, the best directors, etc. It's hard to talk about movies you don't like because, well, you don't like them. But there's a certain charm to a bad movie that oddly makes it stick in your head sometimes more than a movie you liked. To laugh at certain silly scenes or get upset at the nonsensical plot points. For whatever reason, bad movies still end up coming up from time to time in conversation. 1995 was a great year for movies. Coming off the heels of 1994, it has some big shoes to fill. Heat, Casino, Kids, Seven, Clueless, Before Sunrise, La Ain, Toy Story, and Fallen Angels, just to name a few absolute classics. The 90s is considered one of the best decades for film, and it's for a good reason. Known for his satires, acclaimed filmmaker Paul Verhoeven coming off of Basic Instinct, RoboCop, and Total Recall, it seemed like he could do no wrong, and he was ready to tackle his next project. Joe Esterhaus's Showgirls, a screenplay he got a whole lot of money to write, which he started on a napkin. He was paid at the time a record $3 million for Love Hurts, so expectations were high. Las Vegas, naked women, cool dances, and unique costumes. What can go wrong? Apparently everything. I'm going to do this review a little different than I do my others. I'm going to speak a little more conversational about this film. Now... Showgirls, starring Saved by the Bell teen princess Elizabeth Berkeley, she was Jesse Spano, is about a young woman who moves to the lovely city of Las Vegas to become a dancer. She learns the dark underworld of show business and learns a lot of other things along the way. Now, every single person over the age of 27 has heard of this movie. It was NC-17, which was a huge risk, and Verhoeven even put his own salary up for Final Cut. The Saved by the Bell princess getting so excited to bear it all was a huge deal. People may not have been ready for that. This movie was $40 million to make, which is crazy back in 95 for a satirical film marketed as a hard drama. That was a mistake number one. This movie, for the last 30 years, has been considered one of the worst movies ever made, raking in a record number of Razzie nominations at the time. People ripped this film and almost everyone involved in it to shreds, which we'll get more into later. But why has this film now achieved cult status? Why is it still talked about so much to this day? Why do people love to hate this film? Well, I'm going to break it down for you a little bit and figure out, is this movie a dud or a cult masterpiece? Showgirls was released in 1995, directed by Paul Verhoeven, starring Elizabeth Berkley, Gina Gershon, and Kyle MacLachlan. Now, first thing is, this is a Vegas movie through and through, and I love Vegas, one of my favorite cities. And I love Las Vegas movies. Now, this has all my favorite Vegas movie stuff in it. Like gambling, strip clubs, recreational drug use, lots of alcohol, shopping, fights, and dancing. Vegas is a fun city filled with sin and debauchery. But you don't have to indulge in that stuff while you're there. You can have a good time just doing regular vacation stuff. But if I'm watching a film set in Vegas, I want to see Sin City, baby. And this movie is Sin City all day. It shows Vegas in all of its beauty and how fun and great of a town it can be, all the while showing us how this city can bring out the absolute worst in people. The cinematography in this movie is actually pretty good, and I think they got the landscape down very well. So, that is a plus for the film to start off with. Now, there will be some spoilers, but I'm not going scene for scene. We're going to go over some key points to figure out if this movie is ass or not. Now, the movie starts out with our lead, Nomi, hitchhiking to Vegas, and right from the jump, you're kind of like, what the f***? She gets there, gets robbed, 
meets a young girl named Molly, played by Gina Rivera, one of the better actors in this movie, and characters. She acts like a total psychopath, screams, throws french fries, and tells everyone she's from different places. Now, at this point, although I am appalled at how bad the acting is and how Verhoeven was directing then, I remembered it's Verhoeven, the king of satire. I do believe, and I think he confirmed that he directed Elizabeth Berkeley to act this way. Molly lets Nomi move in. Why? I do not know. She met the damn girl like 20 minutes ago, but at this point in the film is where I started to see a shift. Now, this shift is a positive one, but it doesn't come with its negatives. One thing I will say is this movie does get better as it go on. It's like the writing, acting, and direction magically improved. Now listen, the dialogue is still bad, and it's super campy, but you can't help but get invested in the story. We see Nomi stripping, and our little princess Jesse Spano is letting it all out. You see it all. I mean, she was gorgeous in the film, so I don't think anyone was really upset. Now, I've seen this movie before, but I hadn't seen it in at least 20 years. So I'm looking at it in a different light. I truthfully do not think Berkeley gets enough credit for having the gall to do what she did. She laid it all on the line, man, and I think I gotta throw a big level of respect her way. We see she's not happy in what she's doing and wants something more. This boost of confidence comes in the form of a dancer slash bouncer named James, played by Glenn Plummer. Now, Glenn Plummer is actually a good actor, but my lord, my lord, my man's was lost in this movie. His character was underwritten. He didn't play it very well. I just couldn't with this man. Although he is in one of the hottest, most erotic scenes in the film, he didn't even need to be in this movie. Now, two characters get introduced, and I think this is the big turning point in the film. And a good turning point. Crystal and Zach, played by the gorgeous Gina Gershon and Kyle MacLachlan. Crystal is easily the best actor in this movie and is the most interesting character. There's a reason she walked away from this film unscathed. She plays her role well and was very intriguing and was honestly more interesting and better written than our lead. All the best moments in this movie are when she's on screen. It's hard to keep your eyes off of her. She plays the hot attraction for the Vegas topless shows. Now, on the other hand, we have Zach. Wow. I think Kyle Mack is actually a decent actor, but this was just not it for him. I think he was so miscast, and there was just not convincing me he was that guy. Honestly, the cringiest scenes in the movie, he's in most of them. He plays the entertainment director for the Stardust Hotel, and he's the guy to know. He's dating Crystal, but it seems they have some kind of open relationship. Now, Nomi gets introduced to these people, and her life changes. After she gives Zach an interesting, but still kind of sexy lab dance that Crystal pays for, she gets the opportunity to be a part of Crystal's show, and a vicious rivalry between the two begins. All while there is enormous sexual tension between the two, which is, without a doubt, the most interesting stuff in this film. The tension and admiration between these two is insane. The day drinking scene when they are getting to know each other is one of the best examples of this. Gina, honestly, is the star of this show because even though she's a bitch, she's still likable and admirable. Nomi is not. Nomi is funny at moments, but she can be so annoying with the screaming and the temper tantrums. I won't lie. I wasn't rooting for Nomi at all. She starts to change and do things to get to the top, taking the advice Crystal gave her. Essentially, do anything to get to the top. She honestly creates her own monster that is ultimately her downfall. So I can't bring up Nomi's deception without bringing up a particular scene. She seduces Crystal's man, Zach, the entertainment director, in order to gain an advantage, and she eventually becomes Crystal's direct understudy. Now, when they sleep together, they do it in a pool. 
which is fitting because Nomi is flailing around like an injured dolphin, showing us some of what has to be the most unenjoyable sex of all time. I mean, I'm shocked she didn't break my man's stuff off. It seems like this, why this movie has the reputation it has. But don't be mistaken, you are going to be fully engaged and want to see this out even after seeing this ridiculousness. I mean, this shit is comical. I laughed so hard, I sat up and literally started coughing. There are several gut-busting scenes because they are just so bad, you can't help but laugh and kind of love it. I mean, the stage director tells Nomi to put ice on her nipples in front of everyone. The thrusted scene, the Versace scene. I mean, some of the stuff that made it into the movie makes you wonder what actually did hit the cutting room floor. As we get deeper into Nomi's success, the movie starts to accelerate and take on a more, I guess, cabaret approach. We really start getting into the show and the performances, and this is where the movie shines. You see how cutthroat showbiz is. You see that everyone in this movie is morally corrupt in one way or another. These women are very catty and jealous. Most of them are willing to do anything or anyone for their success. For me, the rehearsal scenes, performance numbers, and changing and wardrobe scenes are my favorite. Everything involving the show aspect of this film I felt were done wonderfully. I mean, I love seeing the shows and performance numbers like this with all the costumes, music, and dancing. The Vegas lights and beautiful desert setting for them play against this just made for a gorgeous film, even if what we are seeing is often ugly. Nomi and Crystal's rivalry deepen as a result of her sleeping with Zach. Claws come out and a few of these other girls where there is some sabotage, trickery, and deceit. Injuries occur, toes are stepped on, and lies are told. Unfortunately, Crystal gets injured by Nomi as a result of their fighting, which does end up with Nomi becoming the new lead in the show. They take a gamble on her, with her being unknown and unproven. But it is Vegas. You gotta take the risk. Her show is booming, and her and Zach end up at an awesome after party, in which her best friend, and the only decent character in this movie, Molly, ends up coming to. Now here is my biggest criticism of this entire film. This after party scene is literally the definition of how to kill a film. Molly has a huge thing for this singer, Andrew Carver, who was at this party. Nomi, feeling bad for the fight they've had, introduces her to Andrew Carver, which of course Molly is thrilled about. Now, everything is going cool and we see the film getting ready to wrap up, which at this point, no matter how you feel about it, the movie was flowing for better or for worse. This is when the flow stops. Molly ends up going upstairs with Carver, and they seem to be having fun, until Carver and his two bodyguards violently assault Molly. When I say something comes out of left field, I mean this takes the cake. I mean, it just didn't make sense. It didn't fit the vibe, and it totally just throws the viewer off. Now, I understand why they would put this in the film. It was essentially Nomi's wake-up call. But we could have wrote something way better than this. With the assault, Nomi, of course, is upset. And her true past is revealed as she confronts Zach about his friend Carver. Of course, a bunch of dark stuff, trauma, and a rap sheet. This doesn't matter, though, because she's a star now. So this is where the movie gets a little more ridiculous. Nomi goes on a revenge mission. She seduces Carver and beats this man senseless all while being topless. It's a very interesting, silly scene. And the film closes out with Nomi going to the hospital, saying goodbye to Molly and visiting Crystal, giving Mama a big, nice kiss before she goes. She gets back on the road and hitchhikes with the same exact guy who robbed her and brought her to Vegas to begin with. She threatens him for stealing her stuff at the beginning, and we see them drive off as we look at the Los Angeles mile marker sign, which was supposed to set up her sequel in Hollywood. But this film's failures canceled all that. So, 
Is Showgirls really that bad? Before I answer that, I must address the main thing that bothers me about this movie, and it's how it ruined Elizabeth Berkley's career. I understand this may be the biggest career leap in Hollywood history, going from a teen star on an after-school special to your first big project being something like this. That's a bold and risky move that clearly didn't pay off. But man, this woman got tore to shreds. I mean, her agents dropped her and no one was taking her calls. She never even got the chance to see where she could have gone as an actress. But I'll tell you what, watching this film, Elizabeth Berkley isn't a bad actress. I think she fell victim to a host of things. One being the aforementioned teenage image. Two, this script isn't particularly well written. Three, Verhoeven directed it, so he directed her performances and greenlit them. Four, I think this movie was marketed for something it wasn't supposed to be. If people saw this as the satire it is and didn't go in expecting a hard-hitting drama, I think it would have did better with critics and audiences. And five, it's NC-17, so the box office was doomed from the jump. How did a first-time movie actress become the scapegoat and sacrificial lamb for this film's failures when you have a veteran writer getting paid millions and a veteran director who demanded 100% creative freedom and final cut? She only got $100,000 for this movie. She worked under tough conditions, dancing, and acting, and exposing herself to the fullest, all while working 12-hour days in high heels. That is so wrong, I wish someone would have taken the risk with her, because in the right hands, I think we could have seen some great things come from Elizabeth Berkley. She was always my favorite on Saved by the Bell, along with my man Zach Morris. Now, while I was reviewing this film, I'm sure you noticed I pointed out my criticisms as I rolled with the plot of the story. I have plenty of them. This movie is littered with flaws from top to bottom. Direction, story, acting, editing, you fucking name it. There were so many failed attempts and missed opportunities in this movie. Now this film was a failure at the box office, but it found mega success on home video actually making it one of the studio's more profitable films. It found a large cult following over the years and has been reappraised and seems to have a better reputation. Legends Quentin Tarantino and Jim Jarmusch have both praised this movie. I do believe there is a reason for that. I'm here to tell you that Showgirls is a classic, whether you want it to be or not. A film that was supposedly so bad wouldn't carry this kind of reputation and still be being talked about so much to this day if it was really that bad. We wouldn't be getting expensive 4K transfers made for this movie. It wouldn't have made all that rental money. Showgirls is the most flawed film that I have no problem watching. Showgirls is like putting lipstick on a pig, but the pig is already one of the better looking pigs in the barn. A lot of its flaws are covered up with its glamour and style, which is undeniable. There is no point of boredom in this film, and it is quite entertaining. There is just as much to admire about this movie as there is to hate, and the haters speak loudly. As much as I criticize Verhoeven's direction, I still think it worked, if you know Verhoeven. Robocop, Total Recall, and Starship Troopers are comedy satires in their own way, and that's where the brilliance lies in his movies. I had a blast with Showgirls. I really did. I laughed and smiled the whole time, and would have to say it is a must-watch for 90s fans, Vegas fans, and fans of pretty ladies. Have a few drinks with a friend or your spouse, and watch this movie and laugh together at the shenanigans, all while admiring the spectacle that will be in front of you. So scoring this film, I'm going to score it based on more how it made me feel rather than score in the world of critical acclaim. So overall, I'm going to give Showgirls a 7.3 out of 10. Guys, thank you so much for watching my Showgirls review. Let me know if there is something you'd like me to review. Please, guys, like and subscribe if you made it to the end. It's free of charge. I have a podcast with my buddy, The Cutting Room Floor. I'll link that below. 
I'll also link my letterbox, Ralph Vader. I will be back next week. And don't forget the popcorn.